and see the things they need to do. The unjust steward said, I, I don't want to be left out in the street. I don't want to be a beggar, and I don't want to be digging ditches. He said, I know what I need to do. <clears throat> Basically, he's, he's cautious. And, and he's got a, 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 he understands how to apply his situation in a practical way. He said the unjust people, the people of the world, are more, some, they're more wise. They're more uh, cautious and, 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 and practical than they uh, that, are in, that are in the kingdom of God from time to time. Now I say that because, because the scripture says we shall know the truth and the truth shall set us free. But sometimes we take for granted our freedom. And we are rocked to sleep on the cradle of grace. We understand that we're saved by grace. We understand that God you know, elected a people from the foundation of the world. And then, then people begin to accuse us of being rocked to sleep in the cradle of grace. And there's some truth to that. I, 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 I confess that for myself. <clears throat> that for, for the past two weeks I haven't done the kind of studying that I ought to do. And I certainly not prayed like I know I need to. So I'm, I'm talking about myself here too. But he's just simply saying that there are things that we need to be about doing that sometimes we forget to do. <clears throat> you know, in John chapter 12 and verse 36, Jesus talks about the light. He said, why do you have the light? Now, where, where do we go to find the light? And remember what we say, Jesus said in the fifth chapter of Matthew, you are the light of the world. He said that we are sitting on a hill which cannot be hid. We are the salt and the light of this world. He said, why you have the light? Why you have the truth? Why you have that <coughs> illumination? <clears throat> he said, believe in the light. He said, that you may be children of the light. See, that tells me that being a child of God does not necessarily make us children of light. Light is, you know, do you remember, does anybody here remember the old type of flashlights that had the little, little switch on the side? Did you ever have the experience of the first time you ever saw one that you had to find that little rubber button on the end of the flashlight and how to push that button? I remember the first time I saw one had a difficult time trying to turn the light on. You know, I kept looking for a switch someplace, something to push or turn or twist, but it didn't work. Finally, by accident, I had to notice there was a rubber button on the very end of that flashlight. The Lord said, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. But once I had the knowledge about turning on that light, I was able to work back there and hit the light and illuminate my situation. He said that we may be the children of light. He said in, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8, he said, you were sometimes, Paul said, you were sometimes in darkness, but now you're the light of the world. Now we are the light of the world. So what does he tell us? If we're the light of the world, to do what? That you walk as children of light. Just like the unjust uh, steward to be wise in our own generation, to know the things the Lord would have us to do and to rise up and to do them. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he says that ye are the children of light and the children of the day. He's, remember now he's talking to the church. Brother Sick, I, I want to get specific with you here. When, we, when, when, when a preacher says he's talking about the church, he's talking about disciples. And I've talked a whole lot about discipleship and what that means. We've talked about the attitude of discipleship, I think, the last time I was up here, and about about little about little children. <clears throat> he said, "You are the children of light and the children of the day." He said, "You are not of the night nor of darkness." When we talk about light and darkness, we're talking about truth and error, uh, truth and harmony, truth and chaos, darkness being chaos. But what do we need to do? What's the point in the text? What Paul? What is Paul? When he says these things, is it, is it just an allegory? Or is it something his brother Randy was praying today, this morning, about, about putting these things into practice, going out and doing those things? He said, therefore, let us not sleep. If we're children of the day and children of the light, then we don't need to be asleep. We need to be awake. <clears throat> we need to be conscious. We need to be aware of, the, of our spiritual situation. We need to be acquainted with the things of the kingdom of God and our duty to God. Therefore, let us not be asleep as others do. But let us watch and be sober. Be watchful. Be watchful of what? What are we watching for? <clears throat> we're watching for sin. Watching for corruption. But we're also watching over one another. We're, we're, we're being in contact with one another and talking to one another and praying for one another. To watch and to be sober. To be, to be solemn-minded. To be, to be considerate about the needs and, and, and the, of the church and the needs that, uh, of, uh, of our brothers and our sisters in the church. 
For so they that are drunken are drunken in the night. And it doesn't necessarily mean that when the sun sets. It means that they're in ignorance. Darkness means ignorance. You remember the word, the name Egypt. The Hebrew word Egypt was translated into the word darkness. Same word. For they are drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, uh, uh, putting on the breastplate of faith. But sister, our life is a life of faith. It's not an abstract idea. It's something that we do. It's something that we, we put into practice. When, 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 when our hard times come upon us, we, we start looking around for things to do. When the first thing we ought to be doing is praying to the, to the author of lights, the author and finisher of our salvation, asking him for guidance and instruction and illumination because we are children of the light and children of the day. He said, put it on the breastplate of faith and our faith is in Christ and in love for he, and, and for a helmet uh, that is our mind, hope of salvation. And I've said all that because I want to get back to my, my text and it's found over here Again, this is where we were at last time in the 19th chapter of the book of, of Acts. We're talking about discipleship. And I, and I want to reiterate this again and bring this to your attention again. Because I, I, I've seen it too many times where people are, are asking themselves, well, what about the church? Why are the church doors closing? And I hear people say, well, this church will be here until the Lord is, is finished with it. Now, why, why I'm saying I don't disagree with that. But there's more to it than that. If, 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 if there are no children in the church, let's, let's face it, every day, you know, I got up this morning, you know I'm a day older than I was yesterday? Randy, is that the way it is with you? You're a day older than you were yesterday. This time next year, we'll all be a year older than we were today. And brothers and sisters, uh, the, the people say that the children are the church of tomorrow. I say they're not. They're the children of today. They're the church today. That's why I enjoy baptizing little children. <clears throat> and we talked about when it begins. And I know, I know I'm not telling you something you don't already know. But in the 13th verse of the 19th chapter of the book of Matthew, we're talking about discipleship here. When we talk about letting our light shine, what do we mean? How, how, how do you go out and let your light shine? What, is that, what does that mean to us? What is Jesus, if Jesus will tell us that there's a reason for it, <clears throat> he's not telling us to go out and be bubbly and, and smiling all the time. That's not what he's saying. He's talking about something more, more deep than happiness. He's talking about the joy that's in our hearts. To, to, to let it flow forth. And he said it, it, it begins with our interaction. It begins here, our interaction together. That, that's letting our light shine. Letting, what an encouragement is to know that you're praying for me. How, I can tell you how encouraged I feel knowing that you pray for me, especially understanding that, that, that all of my efforts are vain without the blessings of God. And to know in my heart it is encouragement to me to know that you're praying for me as, as your pastor. And, and I know, Brother Randy, you feel the same way. And, and Brother D uh, Dallas and Joe, brothers and sisters, you feel the same way to know that you're, that you're praying for us and encouraging us. It, it's, it's such a blessing. That's the beginning of letting our light shine. But as we said last second Sunday, it begins at our homes. There's, there's a tie that binds our families and our churches together. Sever the tie and the church withers and dies. He said that we abide in Christ and in us. That abiding doesn't just begin at the church house. It starts in our families and our homes. And then the 13th verse is then we're brought on him little children. We talked about this last, last time. That he should put their hands on them and pray and his disciples rebuke them. I pointed out to you and I want to encourage you again to notice uh, this. It's a foolish statement to say I don't want to influence my children as far as the church is concerned. I have said it myself, brothers and sisters, without really thinking about what I'm saying. Uh, these, these were parents that it, they wanted their children to be with Christ. And they brought them to Christ. They, they used every bit of their influence to make sure their children came to where Christ was at. And, and we believe this morning, I believe you believe like I do, that where two or three are gathered in my name, Jesus said, there am I in their midst. He's here today, with us today. In, in, the, in spirit, he's there, he's with us. But Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. 
uh, uh, for such of the kingdom of heaven. He laid his hands on them and he blessed them. And again, in Luke, in Luke chapter 18, <coughs> he said that they brought unto him also infants. Now, and, and I, I, again, I want to define my term. When I say infants, what are we talking about? Well, we're, you know, when we think of infants, we think about little babies, little babies. But the, when he says infants, this is between being weaned, you know, being off of the bottle, off of the breast, to, to, uh, to a child that walks and ha has some understanding. And in the Hebrew tradition, when, when you, cease to be, you, you cease to be an infant when you're old enough to do your chores. That's, that's the age we're talking about. When they're, old, when they're old enough to clean their room, they're old enough to join the church. I'm going to tell you right now. This is what he's talking about when he says infants. That he should touch them. And the disciples saw it and they rebuked him. And, and, and Jesus called unto him and said, Call them unto them, and suffer the little children to come unto me, forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. There's, there's a blessing that's missed, <clears throat> brothers and sisters, when we cease to uh, obey the Lord and His in the things he commands us to do. Back over in the book of Matthew again. <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 18. <clears throat> and his disciples, did, at the same time, uh, this is verse 1, disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And, and again, I find a lot of our trouble sometimes with baptizing children is this problem right here. When, when we go about trying to... Uh, 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 try to lift ourselves up before God. When we when we start having preacher envy, when we start having competition between one another, and, and start feeling uh, uh, that one one person is better than another. You know, we might we look at others in the world and we say, well, they we see them sinless. Well, I'm not as bad as they are. That when we start taking that attitude, brothers and sisters, we we miss we're missing something. He said Jesus called a little child unto him, and he set them in the midst of them. And he said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as a little children, you shall, you shall uh, not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as a little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever received one of the one such little child in my name receiveth me. I, I don't know how it can be any clearer. If we if if we're concerned, if we're concerned for our church, and I know we are, we need to be praying for our churches, and we need to be praying. For parents to bring their little children to church again. And, and, and I tell you, we don't need, I'm going to tell you what we don't need to have. We don't need Sunday school. I've got no problem with Bible study. I, I, I want you to understand, I have no problem with that. But we don't need a Sunday school. We don't need to bring in a musical instruments. We don't need a choir. We don't need auxiliaries. In the Those things are not necessary to, to bring into the church. It's not my, it's, I'm not called to grow the church. You're not either. We're called to obey the master. And obeying the master begins at our homes. To do the things we're commanded to do. The Lord said he will add daily such to the church. Such as should be saved. He will take care of that. Our responsibility is to obey the master. To be wise stewards. But, the, but who shall offend one of these little ones uh, that believe in me it were better for him that a millstone be hanged about his neck that he should be drowned in the death of the sea. And he's not necessarily just talking about infants, brothers and sisters. He's talking about children of God. We need to speak the truth and we need to speak it in love. And we need, it needs to come, it needs to be a part of our life as, as much as breathing and eating. Brother, it needs to be a part of everything that we do. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must, must need be that offenses should come. If we're going to live godly lives, if we're, if we're going to be disciples of Christ, expect persecution to come. But I'm going to tell you, even if you don't live a godly life, persecution is still going to come. But I, I'd rather go in with the Lord. I'd rather go to the persecution knowing that my brothers and sisters are praying for me and the Lord is with me. He said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. He said, I'll be with you through seven trials and seven troubles. You know what seven troubles is? That means every trouble you have, he'll go with you through it. What would you rather do? Go it alone or go it with the Lord? 
He said, Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses should come. But woe to every man by which the offenses come. Wherefore, if thy right hand, if thy right hand or thy foot offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. What's he saying here? Cut off your hand? No. He's saying if you've got something that gets in the way between you and God, get rid of it. Just get rid of it. Get it out of your lives. Don't, don't, don't. What goes into the eyes and the ears enters into the heart. And what enters the heart comes forth from the mouth. And it affects our attitudes. He says, for it is better for thee to enter the, into life, that is spiritual life, in the church, halt or main. It's better to miss those things and to live in the, in the kingdom than it is to, to have those things and be possessed of the world, rather than having two hands and two feet and cast into everlasting fire. <clears throat> he said, If thy eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is better for thee to enter the life with one eye. One eye. What, do we know something about the one eye? What did Jesus say, Brother Andy? If thy eye be what? If it be single, then your whole body is full of what? It's full of life. I think that's in Matthew chapter 6. If our eye, if our vision is singly focused upon Jesus Christ, seeking Him first in His kingdom, then everything is added to us, but it's God will take care of the rest. In Proverbs chapter 22, please ask you the Proverbs in close. We got this. Jesus has got to be above all things. You see, I used I want to, I want to confess something to you. I used to use it a church the church as an excuse to neglect my wife. And I don't mean in a in a mean and bad way, but I mean I, I, I would I would, it, I, I would I would neglect my wife sometimes some neglect her needs because I needed to go to church and I do need to go to church but brothers and sisters once I found out that when I put my focus upon Christ and upon His kingdom I realized that the, 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 the church required me to love my wife as myself I understood that church, I, once, once I was able to put Jesus Christ as a priority then, then and only then was I able to put my wife in proper perspective. That's the only way that I was able to submit myself to her need to understand what she needed to take the time to understand it. Because I'm a folk of no longer on myself. I wasn't interested anymore about how I looked in the church house. I wasn't interested about how I was dressed or how I combed my hair. None of those, none of those, excuse me, none of those kind of things. In the verse 6 of chapter 22, here's, here's where it begins. He said, train up a child in the way that he should go. Where does it start at? I don't, let's, don't, let's don't miss this. It starts at home with our children and our grandchildren, our nieces and our nephews. How long does it take to drive out darkness? It takes about as much time to turn, to turn the light on. My, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. We, we need to understand these things and go out and do them. Train up a child. Teach and instruct your child in the way, the bent. You know, look at their attitudes and, 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 and direct them in the way that they should go. And when they're old, when they get older, it stays with them. Now, am I saying that if you bring them to church every Sunday and raise them up, they'll stay in the church? I didn't say that, neither does neither is Solomon. But the training they have will stay with them. It will save them a lot of heartache. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen those wayfaring children return again to the church. It happens. And when he's old, he'll not depart from it. We've got to count the cost, brother sisters, of discipleship. Brother sister, can you teach discipleship if you don't know what it means to be a disciple? What, what, you see, there's, there's, there's an understanding, a lack of, of, of things that we need to understand. We, if, we need to understand how we need to be disciples. I can't tell you, brother and sister, anything about discipleship that I don't understand myself. If I'm not living it and putting it into practice, I can no way uh, teach you to, to put it into practice. I can't do it. It's not possible. And it's not. And I, let, let, me, let, me, let me define this a little bit further. You can't teach these things to the world. You can't do that. You can only teach those to the God, who God has opened their eyes and, who, and they have eyes to see and ears to hear. 
And it starts, it starts with every opportunity that we see it, we ought to be doing it. Remember what Jesus said, and I quoted this a minute ago. He said in verse 34 of the 14th chapter of the book of Luke, he said, salt is good. Let, let me say this, discipleship is good. And disciples are here for a reason. What's our, what is our reason for discipleship? If we are salt and light. Salt and light is the essence of discipleship. And he's not saying our, our, our babies are disciples. He said that we are. And, we, and it's our duty to teach discipleship to our children. Jesus said, told the disciples before he ascended into heaven, Go ye into all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Teaching them. Teaching them. What, what does it mean, teaching them? That's, that word is translated in other places, discipleship. Discipling them. What is a disciple? He's a learner. He's somebody who's under a, under a tutor or a master being taught the things. Brother Sister, I've been trying to preach the gospel for some 25 or 30 years. I haven't even begun to understand the scratch and serpent of what the Lord has to teach me. But I'm constantly trying to learn those things. From the study of the scripture and from, from, and from prayer and meditation and in your prayer toward God, to God for, on my behalf. But the salt is good. Discipleship is good. Well, I, I, if, if I don't accomplish anything today, I hope today that if I accomplish at least one thing, that you will go out from this place today being able to say, well, I'm a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the salt is good. You're good when you do that. Preserving our society by turning the light on and driving out the darkness. Salt is good, but the salt had lost its savor. I, I, I was involved in a conversation one time where a pastor of a church, uh, somebody had told him, said, some people say that our church is, is cold and, and asleep. And I, I was just a young pup, brother and sister, just young. Just uh, I, I got to the point where I was shaving every three or four days. Brother and sister, and I, I noticed it too, and I wanted to address it. And immediately he said, immediately he said, I just don't see that. And the deacon said, yeah, yeah I don't see it either. Brother and sister, that's what we've got to be careful of, being complacent. Uh, we need to. We, it doesn't start with your neighbor. It begins with you and I. I can't, brother Dallas. I can't depend on you to shine. Your, you to shine your light. I've got. To, it starts with me first. It begins with us individually. He said. Neither. He said. If it's lost its savor, where would it be seasoned? And I preached about this before. How do you reseason salt? How do you make salt salty again? I can't do that. But God can. He can. He said, it's neither fit for land or yet for the dunghill, but it's cast out. He that hath ear to hear, let him hear. Brother and sister, we have to be salt and light. Discipleship involves us doing those things that we're commanded to do. Back in Matthew, again, chapter 5, when Jesus sits down with his disciples. <clears throat> now, I'm going to read through this pretty, pretty rapidly here, so just buckle up. In that first verse of that of that fifth chapter, <coughs> Jesus doesn't use the word discipleship. But understand, Jesus is the teacher, and we are his disciples. And it said, And seeing the multitudes, he, that is Jesus, went up into a high mountain. And, and, and I, point, I point this out to you if I haven't before. If I have, you, that's fine. Okay. Notice this. It's different than what you see on Hollywood version of this. In the Hollywood version of it, he sees the multitude and he kind of walks through the rolling hills and teaches everybody there. That's contrary to the scriptures. It said, as soon as he saw the crowds, he went to a high mountain. How many people are willing to climb a high mountain to be with Jesus? There's your key. I'll tell you who does. Disciples. Those that are following the master will follow him to the mountaintop. Brother and sister, you came out this morning and sit down under the sound of an old crusty voice preacher this morning. You climb the mount to Mount Zion, brothers and sisters. It's because your disciples, not my disciples, but you came this morning with a desire in your heart to hear the word of God preached this morning. I don't know how effective I am as a preacher or as a pastor, but, but I, I, I love your sweetheart. I love the fact that that's your attitude as disciples. 
We need to instruct and encourage our children to do the same. He said he went to a high mountain, and when he was set, his disciples, his learners, the learners, came unto him. You see, brother and sister, we're not called to make children of God. I have not been called to cause anybody to be born again. <clears throat> it's not my responsibility to populate heaven. Jesus has already populated it from the beginning of, before the foundation of the world. But our calling is to make disciples. It, when, when somebody comes and says to us, why, why are you different? Brother Randy, if somebody approaches you and says, Brother Randy, there's something different about you. Why are you different? That's your opportunity to let your light shine. He said, well, because I love the Lord. I, I, I serve Him in His kingdom. And people, you know, you think people don't want to hear that. I bet you'd be amazed at how many people the Lord has touched their hearts. That's exactly what they need to hear. I remember one time I was telling, I was telling Lisa this morning before daylight when I worked down at, at uh, Huntsville Memorial Hospital and I was walking down a hallway and a, a Mexican woman, one of the housekeepers, spoke, hollered over at me and she said, Thomas, are you a preacher? I had never said anything to her about preaching any at all. And, and I asked her, I said, well, what, why is it that you would say that? She said, there's just something different about your attitude. Something different. It, I, I, somebody told me one time, number of among old Baptists, that, that if you were an old Baptist, I don't know, maybe in the 30s, 20s, or 30s, said, <clears throat> they wouldn't even ask you for a contract. They knew if you was an old Baptist, you was good your word. But you know, how many old Baptists will they, is that said today? Are we that way? And he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, there's an attitude, brother and sister, that requires action on our part. If we don't have the attitude, we won't have the action. He said, he said unto them, this is, the, this is a definition of the character of discipleship. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Brother and sister, you might have a million dollars. I know, but you might have a million dollars. But your spirit and, your, and the flesh is two separate things. Poor in spirit, you look at it yourself. And, and you know, you can never do enough good to satisfy God. The only, the only one that ever did it was Christ. And Jesus said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He never said that about me. Never said that. Poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I, I think I relayed this story to you once before about my oldest granddaughter. Uh, when, when my daughter was talking to her about how good Jesus was, she began to weep, maybe four or five years old, and said, but mama, he's so good and I'm so bad. Poor in spirit, brother sister. That's why Jesus took Instead of child in their midst. He said, blessed they that mourn. What, mourn about what? Mourn about our flesh and condition of our flesh. Mourning about our lack of prayer. Mourning about the good, our good, the good things that we're endeavoring to do. Mourning about our sinful condition. For they shall be comforted. I'll tell you, God hears that prayer. Blessed are the meek. Brother sister, this word meek is not like like little Miss Tuffet sitting on her tuffet. Meekness has to do with power that's under control. Jesus said, I am meek and lowly heart. <coughs> Jesus had all power in heaven and earth, and yet he was the meekest man that ever walked the face of the earth. He was humble. We need to, blessed are they that, are, that humble themselves, empty themselves. I'm not talking about this pretext, this pretense of being look sounded like your own but I'm talking about a heartfelt attitude of humility knowing brothers and sisters that it is in Christ that we live and breathe and have our being and when, when, when the Lord releases that we die it's that simple blessed are they which do hunger I'm sorry blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth I found that those that are prideful they're not they're, they don't possess the earth it possesses them they're consumed by their wealth, brother and sister, but they can't be a disciple of Christ. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness. If that's your attitude, he said, they shall be filled. Brother and sister, you get something out of the preaching when you, this is your attitude. Uh, when it's not your attitude, it's, this is just a place you come on Sunday. But whenever you, this is your attitude, then you leave rejoicing. Uh, uh, brother and sister, you can't wait till you come back again and hear the gospel preached again. Blessed are the merciful. 
Oh, there's a lack of mercy in this world today. It's, we're, we're, we live in a world, and I've seen it in churches. Don't get me wrong. I've seen it among even the Lord's people. You know, we're, we live in a, in, a, in a flesh and blood body too, where mercy is the furthest thing from our minds. But he said, if we, if we are merciful, then we shall obtain mercy. God gives us mercy. I've also found that when I'm merciful to my brothers and my sisters, they're merciful to me. <clears throat> Blessed are the pure in heart. What's the pure in heart? What kind of a disciple has got a pure heart? Anybody here got a pure heart? Raise your hand if you got a pure heart. I didn't think I'd give you takers. But I'll tell you what a pure heart is and you understand what he's talking about. He said, he said, if your eye be single, then your whole body's full of light. He talked about how many of us, the center of our life is Christ. Our focus is upon doing his will. See, there's a different attitude, see. That's what he's talking about, a pure heart. Unmingled by the things of the world. When, 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 we're, when, when the world presses in on us, we press back. We press into the kingdom of God. He said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You see God in a way that can't, that can't be preached. You'll see, you'll, see, you'll see things about God that I can never tell you with my mouth. He'll appear to you in ways and bless you in ways that can't. It's, it's just humanly impossible to describe. He said, blessed are the peacemakers. Oh, I love that. Those people who not only want peace, but go after it. When, when, they know there's a, when they know there's a disturbance in the church, they actively go about trying to get that resolved. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. These are the disciples, brothers and sisters. This is what discipleship is all about. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. I was, as I said a minute ago, persecution is going to come. I don't care where, what kind of life you live, there's going to be persecution. That, no, no wonder Jesus said to Peter, if we live by the sword, we die by the sword. We're going to die. It's going to come. But if we're going to live a godly life, you can rest assured the world's going to come crashing down on you. It's not, it's not going to be popular. But he said, blessed that we were persecuted for righteousness' sake. You can know, brother and sister, to be assured it's because you're doing the right thing. Because it's a righteous thing that you're doing. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. These are discipleship. This is what discipleship is all about. Blessed are, are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Brother Sister, I have seen, I've seen people say things about churches and, and, and Christians, if you will, and discipleship, but I never thought I'd ever hear people say in this world. I remember a time, I know you, you Brother Sister, do too, you remember a time whenever people knew you were, went to church that they behaved themselves in a better way around you? Now that just kind of seemed like it just fallen by the way? I mean, how many times have you watched the news and quote, a so-called preacher has fallen off into adultery or, or, or swindled the church out of millions of dollars, thousands of dollars, whatever it might be, and, and it's a reflection upon everybody around us. These things ought not to be among God's people. He said, for my sake, he said, blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. And do what about it? Rejoice. Brother said, I know what you're thinking. How can I rejoice under persecution? I can't do it usually when it's happening, but I, can, I usually find time to rejoice when I've gone through it. For no kind of persecution is joyful at the time. But once we go through it, we see that the Lord, Lord's hand was in it, and he protected us and defeated us. Then rejoice, he said, for great is your reward in heaven. What is our reward in heaven? Jesus is even now at the right hand of God. And guess what? He's making intercession for us daily, every day. <clears throat> he said, for so persecuted they the prophets which before you. Jesus is simply saying this. When this is our attitude in discipleship, when we put these things into practice, he said, we're in the same company with Daniel. We're in the same prophet. We're, we're in there with, with Solomon. We're, we're in company with, uh, with uh, 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 Enoch who walked with God and was not. We're, we're, in, the, we're in that cloud of witnesses. Of David. But understand these things. <clears throat> he said, You are the light of the world. 
But if the light, if the salt, I mean, excuse me, you're the salt of the earth. And if the salt hath lost its savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It's henceforth good for nothing, but it's cast out, and it's trod under the foot of men. You are the light of the world. I just want you to grasp this thing. Because he's not talking about the world. He's speaking to the learners. He's speaking to disciples. Brother Sister, you are disciples of Christ. You sisters, you're in the same, you're, you're a disciple with Mary the mother of Christ. You're, you're in the company with Mary Magdalene. Brother sisters, Martha. You're, 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 you're numbered with them as disciples. You're brethren. As I said, you're with James, the apostles. Uh, Paul and, and John. You're numbered with them as disciples of Christ. He said, you are the light, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle. And put it under a bushel. Because we're disciples, we cannot, we ought not ever to let to hide our light. We ought not to be ashamed to confess our, our, our faith and love in Christ and his and to serve in his kingdom. We ought not to hide our light under a bushel. We know how to turn that light on. We know because of experience. We need to let that light shine. See, ours is not a goal to go and find us a light. He said, you are, if you're a disciple, you're already a light. But put it on a candlestick, that it might give light to all that are in the house. Doesn't sound to me like he's telling us that we ought to keep silent. The church ought not to be a, a, a closely guarded secret, but our light ought to be, be shined. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works. What are your good works? Being poor in the spirit, mourning. Being meek and humble, hungry and thirsty after righteousness, being merciful, being pure in heart, being peacemakers, and, and being persecuted for righteousness' sake. These are those things, brother and sister, that he's talking about. You, uh, uh, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. That they may glorify you? No. That they might glorify your Father, which is in heaven. We need to deny the dark side. I remember a preacher one time telling me that when I was, was young, I may have told you about this. He said, Brother Thomas, you can always tell a child of God what, what their attitude is by. Uh, 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 they're like two dogs. He said, a black dog and a white dog. He said, you can always tell the difference between the two of which one they feed. If they feed the white dog a lot of you know, spiritual things and you can see they're strong spirited but if they, if they flee, feed the black dog the things of the world then they become worldly <clears throat> and in the 16th chapter of the, Ma the book of Matthew here it said see where I want to, we'll start with verse 21 <clears throat> this is immediately after the transfiguration of Christ in verse 21 of the 16th chapter he said at that time uh, at that time, from that time forth began Jesus to show his disciples. <clears throat> there are things that Jesus, Jesus knew that his time was drawing near. And, and he showed himself to Peter, James, and John. He appeared to them in his divinity. Whatever fashion that took, I, I don't know. But Moses and Elias had appeared to him. And <clears throat> this is where Peter said, Lord, it's good that we should be here. Let us Let's make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. Because he didn't know what else to say. And he, was in, 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 he heard a voice from the cloud that said, This is my beloved son, hear him. You listen to what he's got to say. From that time, he began to show his disciples the things he needs to, he needs to teach them before he, before he departs. How that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised again on the third day. We believe that. We understand that these things have taken place. <clears> then <throat> Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from thee, Lord, that this should be done unto thee. I understand why Peter's worried about this. This is their master. And he began, he began to lead the conversation, began to teach them how he had, he's going to have to suffer, bleed, and die. And of course, Peter's concern said, Oh, this, this, not, this should never happen to you. And so he turned and said to Peter, notice this, look at, at Peter's face and said, get thee behind me, Satan. Is, he, is Peter Satan? No. He's talking about 
what's in. See, Peter, I'm, I'm sure Peter's got some good intentions here. God's not interested in our good intentions, brothers and sisters. He's, a, he's interested in us in obeying Him. You know, when I get my good intentions, sometimes I'll make excuses to do things I shouldn't be doing. <coughs> I need to obey. We need to obey the Master no matter how we feel about it. Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those things that be of men. Then said Jesus to his disciples, If any man will come after me. See, we've got to learn about discipleship, and we've got to set the pace. See the example. I commend the church this morning for everybody who takes the time to get up on, on, on this blustery cold morning and to, to bear those cold north winds and to uh, present yourself as a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. <clears throat> they say, if any man will come after me, we've got to count the cost. Discipleship is not free. It is a cost involved. You know, we're required to do things if we're going to be a disciple. He said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. What's the first thing? What's the first cost? we got to deny ourselves. That is very hard to do when you're like, like me. I, uh, 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 and I might put myself up as an example, and it, it, but, but my hot water heater kind of exploded on me and destroyed the floor underneath it. <clears throat> and I spent my New Year's trying to repair the floor, first trying to fix my hot water heater. And, and I was up late doing that, and that didn't work, so I ended up having to take it apart, and put in a new one, fix the floor, put in a new one, replumb it, and re reconnect everything. It's hard to get up on Sunday morning. I want you to know it, it's hard even when I've been asleep for a good eight or nine hours. But when the body's tired and weary, it's easy to say, I can just lay it just a little bit longer. Oh, I don't think... You know, Brother Randy's over there. I don't really need to go. He can take over. If a man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Brother Sister, I find that uh, when, I don't, when I don't feel like it, it's not my feelings that are important. I know there are times that we get sick. I'm not talking about when we, when we got a fever. I'm not talking about those kind of things. I'm talking about denying our desires and, and placing our needs upon Christ. Come and take up his cross, his burden, and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. What? Lord, what are you talking about? You, I got to lose something? I got to deny myself. He said, if you're going to save our life in the world, you lose your life in the kingdom. He's talking about that blessing as disciples. And whosoever shall lose his life in the world, for my sake, shall find it. I'll tell you what. When you deny yourself, Take up your cross and follow Christ. There's a blessing in it. There's a blessing in it. And I've told you many times, those say, I come here for the blessing. Because I know that when two or three are gathered in my name, I know my master's there. And I know he's free with his grace and his mercy and his blessings. He said, what does a man profit? So why do people go around saying that we don't go to church for the profit? I don't understand people's attitude. I think they get confused about it. I think, I think a lot of times we think it sounds good if we tell people, well, I don't go there for the good I can get out of it. I just, and I, it, it, it's, like, it's like you're like a martyr. Like you're just, oh, I, look how, how pious I am because I get up and go to church on Sunday. But what does a man profit if he should gain the whole world? What, is it, what good is it in our lives if we, if we get all these wonderful material uh, possessions and we lose our soul? We're possessed of the world. What good do we do? Uh, people push their children into in all kinds of... Like they, they, despite the fact that sports stars are constantly falling into, into sins and things, they, they push their children into athletics. I'm not, I love athletics. I'm, I work for the athletic department. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with athletics. But I say they're focused in the wrong place. Or, or push our kids into... Push them into politics. And look how corrupt things are. They don't have any grounding. No grounding in home. What does a man profit if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? <clears throat> or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Brother said, what would you give for this? How valuable is the kingdom of God? What kind of a treasure? Where are your treasures? What, 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 what stock do we put in Christ? 
Is he is he first in our life? I'm, I'm, I'm saying our. I'm not I'm not picking on anybody. We need to love our fellow believers. We need we need to be with one another. I need to start winding this down. Let's go to John, chapter thirteen. Start winding this down. And we'll pick up with verse. 31. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, The son, let me, I guess I better get that who that's gone out. Let's see. He, 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 he just, this is during the communion service, and he just he just told the disciples that one of them was going to betray him. And and he said, and, and, and Peter asked John to ask him, you know, who who is it that should betray you? He said, It's to him to whom I uh, dip us up and get it to him. And he said he dipped this up and gave it to Judas Iscariot. He told him, so whatever you do, go and do it quickly. And, and they thought, well, because he told them to go and do something, that he'd tell them to go do something get ready for the feast. But anyway, therefore, when he was gone out, when Judas had gone out to pray, the Son of Man, Jesus said, the Son of Man must, uh, 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 now is the Son of Man glorified. The time is there. It's time. And God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself. They're glorified together. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And shall straightway, straightway glorify him. See, I, they glorified together in the Trinity. But he said that, that right, shortly hereafter, he's going to be glorified in his death, burial, and his resurrection. <clears throat> and listen to what he says in verse 30, 33, little children. See, we're back to where we started again, aren't we? Where did it start? It started with little children. It started in our homes. Little children. Peter was probably... 68 years old, brother and sister. He was the oldest of the disciples. And he looked at, I don't know if he's looking directly at Peter, but he's, he's calling them little children. Little children. Yet a little while, and I am with you. You shall seek me. As I have said unto the Jews, whether I go, you cannot come. So now I say unto you. He said, I'm going to go somewhere you can't go. Now, let me clarify something to you. You went. Not physically, but spiritually. Positionally speaking, brother and sister, when he went to the cross, all they left were there. That, that we, I hear a song, I don't know if we sing it, but did, did, were, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Yes, we were in Christ. It, it wasn't the nails, brother and sister, that pierced his hands and feet that held him to the cross. It was his love for you and I and the elect that he saved on that cross. You remember he told, he told Peter, Do you not, don't you know that I can call my father? And he'll send 12 legions, that's 12,000 angels, 12 legions of angels that I should not be delivered. See, he didn't have to go. He went for the love of the elect. He said, I'll leave you a new commandment. Okay, the disciples, I said there are things we need to do. We need to obey our master. He says, and I'm, I'm going to bring this to a close, a new commandment I give unto you that you should love one another. When I say love one another, I'm not talking about just being fond of one another. We are a family. Now, I know, I know I'm not related to you folks by blood. Well, I mean, we, 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 through Adam, yes, we are all one man, that blood. But our family ties are closer than that. I know, I know that a lot of folks in here are related <coughs> in, a fam in those family ties. But I'm talking about something that's deeper than that. We are bought by one man's blood. Brother Andy, I, I bought by the same as you are. You're my brother. But Dallas, you know, I'm bought by the blood of Christ. So are you. We're, we're brothers. Sisters, we're, you're my sisters. We're all bought by one man's blood, the, board, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, he says, a new commandment give I unto you that you love one another. That, that we don't just love in our word, but in our deeds. The things that we do for one another and our sending ourselves together in worship is I have loved you. How did Jesus love his brethren? How did he love the disciples? He gave himself for them. He taught them the gospel. He preached to them. He prayed with them, prayed for them. He said, I pray for them. I pray not for the world. We, we can do no less. He said, as I have loved you in the same way as we are able to do in our, as our flesh will allow us to do, we are to love one another in the same way that Christ gave, he gave his love to us. 
that ye also make love one another. We're going to follow his example. And he says, by this shall all men, I'm going to close with this verse. He said, by this, this is how they know. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you love one another, let the Lord bless you. I appreciate your kind attention.